Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, greetings of peace, love and light. We begin in the name of Allah, bismillah ar-Rahman rahim and ask Allah to send infinite and abundant blessings upon our beloved and our guide, Sayyidina Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Alhamdulillah, thank you for joining us for our flagship program, What's Up Wednesday, and for this edition, uh, diving into the deep sunnah with Imam Mendes. Alhamdulillah, um, we've been going strong for the month of January and we're just opening it for the month of February. Uh, before we begin class, I wanted to just make a few announcements about what's its programming this month, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, uh, of course, we have this course that is going to be continuing and um, we wanted to give a special thanks to MAPS, CDEI, for co-sponsoring this course um, this month. And MAPS is a good partner of ours that we've been pleased to work with uh, in many ways. Um, also, alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah, this month for our study circle, which in which we read various books that are reflecting on Islam and our lived conditions as people in North America, uh, we are blessed to be reading Dr. Sherman Jackson's book, Islam and the Black American. Mm -hmm. And alhamdulillah, many of you remember Dr. Jackson was a guest um, at what's it, a year ago, in fact, mashallah, so much has changed in the last year. I believe he was our last guest before uh, we couldn't physically gather. So it was a great blessing. And every, uh, every week we'll discuss, every Monday at 8 p.m., We'll discuss a quarter of the book. And this book is really a profound study. And what you might assume by the name is that it will be a history of names and dates, but it's actually much more um, like a sociological reflection on the factors that led to a communal conversion to Islam in the 20th century. And it talks about the major um, factors for that. Uh, as well as reflecting more deeply on what is necessary for Islam to become rooted and to flourish in these lands um, and what people of all backgrounds can do to support that. And so it's a really profound study and uh, we're really grateful to be discussing it and you're all welcome uh, to read with us inshallah. Uh, and also, alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah, many of you joined us what was it last week for uh, Peter Abdul Adim Sanders, a program in which he shared meetings with mountains, his po uh, photographic journey and encounter with the saints and sages of Islam. That was really beautiful. And alhamdulillah, this month for February, um, our guest speaker is Imam Dawood Walid. And inshallah, he's going to present and we'll be in conversation discussing his newest book about blackness and Islam. Um, and he's written a lot of amazing books about, he wrote a book about black Sahaba, black Ahl al-Bayt, Companions of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, uh, which ties in with the class that Imam Mendes is just coming from, uh, with celebrate mercy, but I'll let him speak about that, mashallah. And uh, we really... Uh, honor Imam Mendes for, for knowing that he's been for hours serving and teaching in this way and that it's late where he is. So uh, alhamdulillah, we're honored to have him with us and uh, blessing our community. Um, so alhamdulillah, that will be on um, February 19th and you can register on the website, February 19th at 7 p.m. Inshallah, we'll talk to Imam Dawood about 
um, about race and around, around blackness and around Islam and around all these conversations, which are not the most easy conversations to have, but are very important conversations for all of us to have because uh, the name Wasat comes from the verse uh, we have brought you forth as an, a, a middle nation, a nation of balance, an exemplar nation that you would exemplify for humanity through uh, following the exemplar. Peace and blessings be upon him. And so the extent to which we follow our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the extent to which um, we can uh, exemplify the fullness of humanity, inshallah. And uh, to be healers, we have to heal, inshallah. So we pray that it will be so. And we have a number uh, of other programs this month, including our Quran study circle and our heart-centric check-in. You can find all of that online and uh, at We Are What's It. Um, so inshallah, without, without further ado, I want to pass it over to our dear, beloved brother, Imam Adinka Mendis. Bismillah. Ahlan wa sahlan. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, dear, dear, dear brothers and sisters, friends, elders, youth, uh, thank you uh, for your, your diligence and uh, thank, may Allah, you know, bless uh, the entire Wasat community for hosting uh, this really important. I think, you know, really this is one of the most important classes, courses, um, you know, gatherings that I've ever, you know, shared at uh, the uh, Black Lives Run the Messenger course that I was, I was just in like literally a few minutes ago. Uh, and I was kind of lost in thanks to Baraka Blue's text that <laughs> brought me out. <laughs> um, you know, Imam Zaid uh, Shakir, Allah preserve him, was speaking about the importance of transcending uh, our, our complexions and our, the colors of our skin and, and breaking free from the shackles of physicality. And, and you know, it's, I, don't, I don't think it should be lost on any of us that that's what this, this is about. That's what we've been learning about the past uh, three, four weeks though, from, you know, from Sheikh Saleh al-Jafari. And we, we live in these bodies, don't we, right? I, you know, I am a man who lives in a black body, right? And in my particular time in history, this black body means certain things to different people, right? Uh, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. Some of you are female, right? Some of you are, are, are European. Some of you uh, are from the indigenous nations. Some of you are Latino or Latina. Some of you are Asian. And we have these bodies that Allah has blessed us with. And as I mentioned last week, the body Allah has given you, your particular context, has everything to do with the mission you've been sent here to do. You know, why are you here? And, and this is one of the most important aspects of the spiritual path. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad, wa alayhi wa sallam. And so with that, uh, I know some of you were with me, you know, at the Celebrate Mercy program, <laughs> you made the jump. Uh, I wanna ask that you, you know, stay for all 10 sessions. Uh, there's so much in that course that's not just history. It's about spirituality. Imam Suyuti, you know, just a secret. This is something I won't say in the course, you know, but I will say here because uh, we're in a safe space. You know, when Imam Suyuti was 40 years old, he left the company of human beings. 40 years old, not 50, not 60, not 70. 40 years old, he left the company of human beings and he went and lived in a place in Southern Egypt in the desert, right? Uh, and he was, you know, there was a small masjid there and, you know, and he would spend most of his time writing and that's where most of his, uh, you know, 600 
700 works that are attributed to him, that's when most of them were written. Right? This one man, six, 700 works. And one of the things that he mentions during those years that he was uh, in solitude, you know, with his family in the desert, and it didn't matter who summoned him, his friends begged him to come back to Cairo, right? His, the, the rulers, the Salatin, the kings summoned him back. He didn't go. He was like, I'm done with that. Right? I'm done with, you know, being a professor and, you know, I'm done with notoriety. I'm done with uh, the things of this world. And so he focused on his spirituality. He focused on his scholarship. And so one of the things about Imam Suyuti, which again makes this book such a joy, the, the book that he wrote about the black nobles uh, that lived before the Prophet Sallallahu who lived in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and those who lived in the centuries after him, after his passing, the passing of the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what makes this book so special, and you can, you can taste it in his book. Imam Suyuti says, when he, when he withdrew away from people, and entered a state of what's called Uzla in Arabic. So Uzla is not Khalwa. Khalwa, we talked about that last week. Khalwa is when you're in, when you're sequestered in a in a room, or it could be a house or a cave, or you know. But Uzla is, you know, when you're just you withdraw away from uh, social interactions. You severely limit your social interactions. You might call it social distancing. <laughs> and we, we've been in Uzla, collective Uzla around the world for the past year almost. And Uzla is one of the four pillars, one of the four pillars of the spiritual path. We talked about these. The other pillars are moderate sleep, right? Little sleep. The, 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 the scholars of the heart say, call, they say, Sleep little, eat little, speak little, socialize little. And you'll find this across religions. You'll find these four, those people who are seeking absolute truth, people who are seeking the, the deepest and most profound meanings of the universe, of the cosmos, you'll find that they do these four things, regardless of the religion regardless of the spiritual tradition. So I know I've been kind of, you know, leading you on here, but let me just say what happened. So Imam Suyuti said in those years that he was away from people, he would often have waking visions of the Prophet Sallallahu Now he was a scholar. He was a scholar of every Islamic science. Those of you who know about him, you know that he, he wrote two tafsirs of Quran. He wrote commentaries on Hadith books. He wrote books on logic and, you know, language and, and, and jurisprudence and hadith and, you know, and, and so many other subjects. And he said during those years, he would directly, he would have these visions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but they weren't just visions. He would actually talk to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he would ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is this hadith really sahih, <laughs> right? Is this hadith, really authentic did you really say this you know this is spirituality like this is true spirituality it's not spirituality is not you know dicker beads you know using dicker beads and uh you know crystals and reading bad translations of rumi right true spirituality is like imam zaid shaka just said you know it's 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 breaking the shackles that bind us to the physical world so that we can see beyond the veil, right? While we're in these bodies, while we eat, drink, and you know, raise families and work our jobs and run our businesses, you are able to see beyond the veil. So alhamdulillah. And, and as we're, we go to the third hadith in this series, um, let's look at the progression. So the first hadith, the chapter heading, those of you who have the book, is on love, right? So this is the goal. Like he starts with telling you, Sheikh Saleh is telling you, this is the goal. 
The goal is love. I'm just setting my timer here so I don't go over. Bismillah. The goal is love. Here we go. And love of Allah, love of God, the creator, the divine reality, love of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, love of Ahmed. I'll share something else with you that's really profound because it, it helps put this in context. It doesn't mean you don't love yourself. It doesn't mean you don't love your family. It doesn't mean you don't love your friends. It doesn't mean you don't love, uh, you know, chili cheese fries. I don't know, right? Biryani, egusi, and ebba, and you know, whatever it is, jollof rice, or whatever you love, right? Kimchi, okay? Whatever you love to eat. You can, this, that still has its place. But you love Allah and you love Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, more than any of that. Like nothing eclipses your love for God and your love for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And let me share something with you that helped put this into context. Yeah, different, you know, shared, shed another light of meaning for me. Uh, Sheikh Ibrahim and Yas, I've spoken about him before. He, he was a great Senegalese scholar and spiritual master. His, one of his daughters, Sheikh Maryam Inyas, just passed away a few months ago before the end of 2020. And, and now that it's on my mind, please make dua for one of my teachers, uh, Sheikh Marab Ahmad Fal. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with him. He passed away. We got news of his passing this morning. He was one of the, he was one of the great scholars of Mauritania, of Shinqit, one of the students of Murabat al-Hajj. Uh, the father, Sheikh Abdullah, who came to the United States in the 90s. So let us recite al Fatiha for his soul. I mean, Marab Ahmad Fal is one of the most beautiful human beings I've ever met. Not just in his character, like literally his beauty, like physical beauty. He was so handsome, so beautiful, that when myself and other people first like met him and, and looked at him, we would we it it our eyes would tear up. One of my friends actually started crying. I, I don't know if you can imagine someone so beautiful that you weep. Right? And, and so he passed away uh, yesterday. So what's the, you know, what's this love? Sheikh Ibrahim Inyas from Senegal, he said that nothing in reality, only, there's only two, two beings that exist in reality. He said Allah exists in an absolute sense. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam exists. And everything in creation, everything in creation, everything is really a part of what Sheikh Ibrahim Inyaz calls the cosmic Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That there's a reality to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that transcends, like Imam Zayed said, his physicality. And so every creature, good, bad, and ugly, is a part of this Muhammadan cosmic reality. And so you're a part of that. So to love the Prophet وسلم, is to love yourself. Allah says, Wa'lamu anna fikum Rasulullah. Realize that within you is the Messenger of God. So we start with loving Allah and the Prophet. وسلم, like that's where we're going. And then the next hadith, the Sheikh shares this hadith to show us what? How to get there. How do you get to love of God? <laughs> and so we learn about, 
you know, etiquette and manners with the, uh, the awliya, with the allies of God, the friends of God. And then we learn about fulfilling our duties and, and we learn about uh, uh, doing what is beyond our obligations so that we become beloved to God. And then we learn about love, like what happens when God loves you? Your hearing, your vision, Allah becomes your hearing, your vision, right? In a way that befits his majesty, that's free of incarnation and indwelling. And now in this hadith, we see that the Prophet Sallallahu Sheikh Saleh brings a hadith that shows us how people experience someone who Allah loves. The effect that they have on people. Uh, people ask me all the time, well, how do you know who's the wali? How do you know who the awliya of Allah? How do you know, right? I think someone asked, you know, last, a couple of weeks ago, do the awliya of Allah know that they're awliya, right? So let's read this hadith, inshallah. It's titled, this chapter is titled, God's Friends. An ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. An an nabiyya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal. Awliyaullahi alladhina idha ru'u dhukir Allah. Bismillah. On the authority of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him. The Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, The friends of God are those who, when they are seen, God is remembered. Mm. Wow, alhamdulillah. Uh, so this hadith, mashallah, uh, it's in a book called Ruh al-Sunnah, which I hope I can get a copy of one day, inshallah. It's a, it's a book called The Spirit of the Sunnah, right? by this Sheikh, the teacher of Sheikh Saleh al-Jafari, Sheikh Ahmed ibn Idris, mashallah, the spirit of the path, the spirit of the path. May Allah give us success. I, I think that's a book that needs to be translated, you know, Sheikh Ahmed, inshallah, the spirit of the path. And um, it's narrated by Imam al-Tirmidhi, by, I'm sorry, Hakim al-Tirmidhi, and Imam al-Suyuti, who we've been talking about, uh, he mentions it in the, he narrates it in uh, his collection, the smaller uh, collection. So it's narrated on the authority of Ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and his father. When, so when you hear his name, you, you say, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, because uh, Abdullah was the son and Abbas was the father. They were relatives, cousins. Abbas was an uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Abdullah was one of his cousins. And was one of the great, great scholars of the companions, uh, particularly known for his knowledge of the Quran, right? And so what is this hadith telling us? All right, and before we, we dive in, the friends of God are those who when they are seen, God is remembered. What does that mean to you? What does that mean? You can either uh, unmute your unmute or write in the chat. What does that mean? Yes. The friends of God, the allies of God, awliyaullah, alladhina idha ru'u dhukirallah. They are those who, when they are seen, God is remembered. The Amal says, someone who reminds you of God without using words. Yes, they remind you of God. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this is the, the most fundamental meaning. All right. So before they speak, before they say a word, you remember Allah the moment you set your eyes on them. This is how the Prophet Sallallahu defined the awliya. <laughs> when you see them, 
you don't remember yourself. When you see them, you don't remember them. Can you imagine All right. meeting someone, seeing someone? And when you see them, their, their aura, their presence doesn't call you to them. Rather, their presence calls you to consciousness of Allah. They don't remind you of the dunya, of the material world. They don't remind you of you know, luxury and comfort or they don't remind you of politics. They don't remind you of Trump. Right, and, you know, yes, Kanwa, thank you. I Some mothers, right, some mothers. You know, may Allah make our mothers amongst those who remind us of, of Allah, all right? I mean, uh, there's some mothers who remind you of the dunya, right? But then there's some mothers that remind you of the hereafter. And then there's some mothers who remind you of Allah. There are some scholars who, when you see them, when they open their mouth, they remind you of this world. Scholars, imams, shuyukh, okay? Let's just, you know, as, let's just keep it 100, as they say. There are people like this, they, who are religious people, but when they talk, they make you feel like the dunya is this big, that the, the material world is this big, and you are this small. They bring you into a state of heedlessness. And then there are other scholars, they all they remind you of is paradise. And they will describe paradise to you. They will, they will, call you to Jannah, call you to prayer, which is a good thing, which is a good thing, right? But there's something higher. Isn't there something higher than Jannah? Huh? It's the creator of Jannah, the master of paradise. Paradise is created. Right? It's created. And not only that, paradise was made for you <laughs> while you were created for, for who? Allah. Right. This whole universe was created for you. This whole universe was created for your benefit while you were created for Allah. To discover Allah, to know Allah. And so these men and these women and these boys and girls, because the awliya could be boys or girls as well. They could be children. In fact, you might have a child in your home who's one of the awliya. Don't imagine the awliya are, you know, old men with gray beards. <laughs> the awliya are hidden. Most of them are hidden. And there are pe they are people that when you see them, they remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, that I have many stories, many stories I can tell. And I'm sure many of you, I know Ahmed Baraka Blue has these stories as well of, of, of teachers that we've met over the years, we've, learned, we've kept company with, and we'll be, we'll be with them at the airport, or we'll be with them at a restaurant. And complete strangers will be walking by and they'll stop in their tracks and walk up to that man or that woman and say, I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are, but there's something different about you. Pray for me. I know you're a person of God. Uh, Baraka Blue, no? Yeah. Complete strangers. It's 
sometimes those meetings are very awkward, right? Like one time Habib Ali Jifri was at the airport and uh, this lady, um, she was a Latina lady, you know, she was Latina and, um, you know, she came and she, she said, you know, priest, you know, she said something like, priest, please, you know, you know, put your hand on my head and pray for me. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> and so Habib Ali quickly took his, his shawl and, you know, put his hand between his shawl and, and her head and, and prayed for her and mashallah, and mashallah. And she went on, right? but there's something that she saw there, right? Many stories like that, many stories like that. Sheikh Saleh al-Jafari says, quoting the, this narration, when they are seen, God is remembered. And that is because of the attachment of their souls to God. Jala Jalalu and their nearness to him. So they are like the one that delivers musk. If you come close to him, you smell a beautiful scent that reminds you of the beautiful smelling one. Sallallahu alayhi wa And that is why when you smell such a scent, you say, Oh God, send blessings upon our master Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so the Shaykh is telling us something very profound here. That you know, these awliya what you're seeing through them is nothing but the light of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and so you should know that when you encounter them that you are encountering a an inheritor of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam a moon that revolves that orbits around the sun of prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This reminds me of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about the perfume seller and how keeping company with the perfume seller, you know, it, 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 it gives you a beautiful scent, even though you have no perfume. And if you keep company with, uh, you know, the, the, smoke bo the smoke blower, right? you become smoky and you know you don't smell that nicely it's a it's a hadith about the importance of companionship and uh, mashallah i asked sidi ahmed for permission uh, to go deep and so let's go deep uh, for a moment let's go a, a mo deeper for a moment let's talk about companionship with the awliya of allah When Allah wills for you to become one of the awliya. Okay, we talked about this before. Yes, every person who says La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah is one of the awliya in a general sense. Right? Like you should know that about yourself. Like once you believe La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah you have a, a great rank even if not even if even though we commit sins even though we fall even though we come up short even though we are flawed and broken it's related that Imam Abu Hassan al-Shadri said if you were able to open the heart of the disobedient Muslim a light, you would see a light. If you were able to open their heart and see with the eye of your heart, you would see a light coming from their heart greater than the light of the sun. So, so, so we want more than that though. Right. We want more than that. We don't just pray that Allah grants us general wilaya. We want wilaya al khasa. We want the the sainthood, the allyship of the elite of Allah's servants, al muqarrabun. Allah calls them al muqarrabun in the Quran. Uh, Allah says, as sabiqun, as sabiqun, ulaika. Al-Mukarrabun fi Jannati Na'im. 
the foremost, they are the foremost. They are those who are near and blessed gardens. So these people, you know, Sheikh Abdul Aziz at Dabag, we talked about him, I think, right? Abdul Aziz at Dabag, great, great, great saint, Wali from Morocco. He said that if you keep company with these friends of God, and when you want, when Allah loves for you to become one of them, He guides you to them. So, you know, we, we, we often lose sight of how blessed we are, how fortunate we are to know the men and the women around us that remind us of Allah. When you find a person who reminds you of Allah, know that Allah wants you to become like them. It's not an accident. Let me say that again. No, when Allah guides you to the presence of someone who reminds you of Allah, it is because Allah loves for you to be like them. And Sheikh Abdul Aziz al Dabbagh, I, I won't go into too much detail, but he basically says he has a book called Al Ibriz, right? Pure gold alloy, pure gold. And it's all about his teachings and his experiences. And, and towards the end of the book, he basically says, you become like the people you keep the company of. To make a long story short. You know, he goes into all these things about, you know, what he see, what Allah unveiled for him, you know, what he saw in, in people. And, and, and again, I'm paraphrasing for the sake of time. And he said, I saw people that had the, the signs, signs of wretchedness, signs that they were destined, headed for the hellfire. He said, I saw people like this with the eye of my heart, but I noticed that if they kept the company, when they kept the company of those people upon whom I saw the signs of eternal felicity, the signs of sanctification, over time, gradually, they too had the signs of those destined for eternal felicity. This is all about suhbah, brothers and sisters. That's how the companions of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, became the companions. It was through companionship of the Prophet and who, like, So when you find people like this, seek their companionship, keep their company, learn from them, support them, assist them, give them something of your time and attention and, and benefit, yeah, benefit from them, you know, benefit from them. Not just while they're alive, but after their death. Sheikh Saleh Jafari says at the end of this chapter, he says, likewise are the friends of God, they remind you of God, exalted and transcended as he, by what they have of divine attraction, a jadab, Absorption in God's, in contemplation of God. It's an absorption that causes a person to lose their own self-awareness. It's like a, it's, it's like a deer that's, you know, you know, like a deer is looking at some bright headlights and it's just, it's, it's frozen. These people, because of what they are, 
witnessing and their consciousness of God's presence, the overwhelming consciousness of Allah's presence, they become blind and oblivious to everything but Allah. Right? And that state, and that state, that state goes along with them. The scent of that state goes with them wherever they go. He says, scents that made scents that made them smell beautiful. Gnosis, knowledge of God. Gnosis, marifa, knowledge of God, experiential knowledge of God, not, not head knowledge of God, not Akida classes and theology and creed and which have their place. They have their place and they have their benefit, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about heart knowledge of God. Uh, we're talking about the, the belief of the elderly woman, right? <laughs> that Imam Fakhruddin Razi spoke about. Mm -hmm. Al Ajuza. He goes on to say, these people, the, it's their nearness that made them rare. It's the light that shines from them. It's a secret that has flown to them. Effusions that effused over them, floods over them from the source of effusions and words that you hear from them like wine. Here again, he's using wine again because that is really the only way you can describe what it's like to be in their presence and to learn from them. There's an intoxication, spiritual intoxication. You will often see them lined up in rows in prayer. Sometimes you see them while awake and sometimes you'll see them in your sleep, in dreams. And now when you see them in your dreams, as I know many of you have seen awliya in your dreams, it's because Allah again wants you to become, become like them. My, one of my teachers told me, you don't see the Prophet Sallallahu or one of the companions or one of the awliya, except that something inside you changes for the better. You're not the same person when you wake up. You're a different person. And then he, I'll end with this. He says, if you were to visit them, right, the awliya of Allah, in any state, before or after their death, you would gain the most treasured gifts. And that's why it's always been a part of our culture as Muslims since the time of the Prophet ﷺ, to visit the graves of people believed to be righteous and pious. And it's only in the, you know, I don't want to get into naming groups, but it's just very recently, about 200 years ago, <laughs> that you had a movement that actually discouraged Muslims from going to visit the pious and the righteous who were who had passed, who were in cemeteries. And yes, there, there were some excesses, you know, some excesses, Muslims doing things uh, that were unbefitting of those places. Uh, but nothing that warranted the kind of hostile, hostile, violent discouragement and, and even desecration of these sacred, sacred burial sites. I mean, look at the sister-in-law of Tony, Tony Blair, right? Like she embraced Islam going to where? You know, she went to the, uh, the burial site of, was it Imam Musa Qadim? Right, one of the family of the Prophet Sallallahu So, if you missed them during their lives, during their life, then go visit them in their death. He says their breaths are perfumed, their gazes are spiritual, and their states are Muhammadan Sallallahu He who sits with them shall not suffer. Jalisuhum la yashqa, from a hadith. And their disciple will be elevated because of them. Alhamdulillah. And so we'll stop there, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah ta'ala make us from the awliya. And don't think it's, this is something that's far-fetched or impossible. You know, uh, one of my teachers used to say, وَمَا ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِعَزِيزِ 
It's not difficult for God to do, to make you from among those who remind people of Allah and guide people to Allah. And uh, alhamdulillah. So we ask that Allah Ta'ala give us success. And um, the next hadith, inshallah, that we'll be covering next week. Again, will teach us how to enter into the fortress of, of sainthood with God, alhamdulillah, from the master of the awliya after the prophets and messengers. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. So thank you. Alhamdulillah, we'll stop there, inshallah. And, and so it's this simple, brothers and sisters, this simple. Um, as I've said before, the awliya, most of them are hidden. They are usually not the people that you think. They're not people necessarily with the title, like a sheikh or imam or ustad. They're not people that you know, have turbans and you know beautiful Yemeni shawls and you know, and uh, a lot of times they're just the most humble, unassuming people. The person that no one thinks about. Alhamdulillah. Many of many of your mothers are awliya. Yeah, alhamdulillah. So we'll stop there, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah reward you all for your patience and listening. And I look forward to your comments and your questions. Alhamdulillah. So uh, I want to encourage people to um, type their questions, any questions you might have in the chat. And um, while that's happening, um, I wanted to recite a short poem, very short poem about one of the awliya that was really inspired by what you mentioned, CD Sheikh Mendes. Uh, and that it's inspired by... Uh, Someone named Sheikh Abdul Salam ibn Mashish, who was one of the great awliya of North Africa, many of you know, and the teacher of Imam Shadali. And uh, if any of you have visited him or seen, his uh, grave is at the top of a mountain. And it's kind of an arduous journey to get there. And at the grave, there's a tree that's growing out of the, the grave. And uh, the people there, they would tell you that the tree is growing out of his heart. The tree is growing out of his heart. And so just that inspired this poem. It's a short poem called, They Say There Is a Tree. They say there is a tree atop a mountain growing out of the heart of a saint. Or perhaps they say, the mountain itself is growing out of his heart. Or maybe they even say, the whole cosmic mountain, this entire universe is growing out of his heart. Each galaxy a cluster of fruit on his great and bowing limb. And I won't blame you for not believing the part about the mountain if you yourself have never been a tree growing out of the heart of a saint. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, may we be those those trees. I mean, where where are you keeping these poems, Zidi? I've never heard that one before. Yeah, this, <laughs> is, this is a manuscript for the next book, so oh, well, make sure that it is brought you, into fruition. Brother, we need to talk. You need to send me like something, you know, like, you know, subhanAllah. Yeah. I, I would love to hear it again. Do we have time? Do we have time for you to recite it again? Sure, sure. Please, yeah, please. That's subhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Sumeya Wahid, mashallah. Is that Sumeya Wahid? From Columbus, my Sumeya Wahid. Huh? Just say, say. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar. Mashallah. Mashallah. How are you, the family? We're good, Alhamdulillah. Sorry about that. Mashallah. Great. Thank you for thanks for joining. Mashallah. Give my salam to your husband and you know Sophie and Sheikh Abdullah and Mashallah. Sophie was. 
just everyone. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> I just saw her name and I was like, amazing. I'm, you know, Sophie used to be in my um, Sunday school. One of my, she was one of my Sunday school t- students when I was in college, you know? So back in like 1997, 96. Yeah. Mashallah. Yeah. Mashallah. Yeah, you had a big impact in our lives, Mashallah. Thank you, Mashallah. Mashallah. Wow. Okay, great. I'm sorry, Sidi uh, Ahmed. Yeah, please go ahead. They say there is a tree. They say there is a tree atop a mountain growing out of the heart of a saint. Or perhaps they say the mountain itself is growing out of his heart. Or maybe they even say the whole cosmic mountain, this entire universe is growing out of his heart. Mm. Each galaxy a cluster of fruit upon his great and bowing limbs. And I won't blame you for not believing the part about the mountain if you yourself have never been a tree growing out of the heart of a saint. Alhamdulillah, thank you. We have a number of questions. Um, uh, Rashida asks, I'm not really understanding about the visit of the graves of the pious. Can you please clarify? Jazakallah khair. Yeah, mashallah. Thank you, Sister Rashida. Um, the question thank you for all your support i've been seeing sister rashid on all kinds of zoom <laughs> meetings over the past month you know so alhamdulillah thank you for your your support your your passion alhamdulillah your presence um so you know visiting graves grave sites uh was something that prophet muhammad did allah bless him and grant him peace he would go he actually purchased land when one of his companions, his name was Uthman ibn Mad'un, he was an elderly man. He became Muslim in Mecca, you know, and a lot of stories about him, but he grew, he, he purchased that land just uh, for him. And initially it was covered with thorns. Uh, it was called um, Baqi al Arqad, right? And now we know it as Janatul Baqi, right? Where, which is out in Medina, uh, just, you know, a few hundred yards from the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu and where many of the companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, thousands were actually, thousands were buried. And, and anyone uh, who dies in Medina is buried there, right? And uh, may Allah Ta'ala make us among those who are buried there. Uh, it's, um, you know, those are good neighbors, right? You want you want good neighbors when you're alive. You want good neighbors when you're past. Right? So may Allah Ta'ala make us from the people that are buried in Jannah to Baqiya. Uh, and if not, then may Allah cause us to be buried in the branches, the trees that come from the heart, mm. as uh, Abarak Abu just described, of Jannah to Baqiya that are around the world. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after Uthman was buried there, and after other companions in his lifetime were buried there, some of his wives, some of his children, right? Uh, he would go there. He would go there and he would visit them. And, and he didn't just go and visit, he would actually speak to them. He would say, Assalamu alaikum, Ahlul Qubur. Peace be upon you, dwellers of the graves. Min al mu'minin wa mu'minat, from the faithful men and women. Wa inna bikum, insha'Allah, lahikun. And we soon will be meeting you. Afan Allahu. Right? May Allah Ta'ala give you and us well-being. He would speak to them, which is very profound. And I don't know, I mean, Ahmed, you, you know, you're a student of religion. I don't know if we have narrations of other religious leaders, spiritual leaders in human history, speaking to dwellers in cemeteries, like recorded. Allah knows best. But that's a, that's a really powerful thing. And the second he prayed for them, he would pray for them. And he would often go to the cemetery and weep, weep till his beard, his blessed beard was just drenched with tears. 
and he encouraged initially he uh, forbade the companions from going uh, to visit uh, graveyards um, out of concern for certain excesses in Arab culture at that time. And, uh, but then that uh, prohibition was lifted and Allah gave permission for him to give permission to his companions and by extension, everyone after to the day of judgment to visit the graves of the pious. And since uh, his time and the time of the companions and the, the, the generations after them, Muslims have made it part of their, some, for some people daily, for some people weekly, for some people monthly, some people they make it an annual uh, routine to go to Muslim graveyards to remind themselves of death. Yes, even women, Arir, uh, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, even women, even women, uh, Islamic law is very vast and very broad. And uh, there are many, many, many scholars that say there's absolutely no problem with women visiting graves and the graveyards. So even though I know that there's some more conservative schools of law and conservative scholars that don't allow women, even, you know, it's crazy. Some of these scholars, they don't even let, you know, wives go to the, you know, graveyard to bury their husbands or their sons, which, or their brothers, which is just preposterous to me. But anyway, um, so yeah, and, and what you've, what we found over the centuries is that people have found great benefit, like spiritual benefit, that, 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 that visiting such people uh, when they pass away has the same, if not greater benefits spiritually than visiting them when they're alive. Yeah. And a lot of times, um, you know, like these, as Prophet Muhammad taught us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the people who are buried, uh, they're physically dead, but their spirits are still alive. They are, they can still hear you. Like they, they hear who comes to visit them. And so when you give them salam, they give you salam, right? And the salam of someone who's, who we believe is pious and, and with Allah is so powerful. And the salam of someone who's crossed over, right? And they know the realities of the unseen. That salam is worth gold. Like we give a salam and we're distracted, you know, right? Like my children, some of, some of my children, you know, I come down and they're on whatever, whatever electronic device and sonic, sonic, you know, it's like distracted, right? Right. Like there's no distraction with their salam. When you pray for them, they pray for you, right? Like the Prophet Sallallahu said. So, so that's some, those are just some of the benefits of uh, visiting. And I encourage you, uh, Sister Rashid and everyone, if there's a, a, a Muslim cemetery or, or even if there's a cemetery where Muslims have a plot, make a regular habit of, of going to visit and take your children, you know, take your children to visit and pray for the people there. Um, the next question is, uh, how do you recommend reclaiming our purpose that we forgot when we came into this world? Mm. There's a number of ways to do that. Uh, one of my uh, one of my teachers, Imam Fode, he says, the, the, what, the more dhikr you do, the more you remember Allah, the more you will remember yourself. Because Allah says in the Quran, they forgot God, so they forgot themselves. Ansa Allah fa ansa nasi Allah fa ansa hum anfusa hum. Another way, so one is dhikr of Allah. And, and you can start by just calling on the names of Allah, right? Take that list of 99 names and you know, every morning, every evening, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Malik, Ya Quddus. The more you remember Allah, the more Allah will help you to remember who you truly are and why you're here. 
Secondly, secondly, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, when you fast, before you break your fast at sunset, ask Allah to teach you who you truly are, your highest self, and what your mission is, what your purpose is. Like, why am I, why am I here? What am I here to do? I'm not just here to shop. I'm not just here to earn degrees. I'm not just here to, you know, raise a family. And, and raising a family is a great virtue. But how many women, how many men are sterile or impotent? How many people never get married? Are we then to say that they didn't realize the purpose of their lives? No. <laughs> So ask for that, ask for that. And then a third thing uh, is just pay attention. I mean, all the time, like I try to help the people around me. Your purpose is the thing you've always loved to do. I mean, when you were seven years old, when you were eight years old and 10, 11, or when in high school, like what was it that you enjoyed doing the most? And for some of us, it's writing, for some of us, it's singing, for some of us, it's, it's you know, we're always playing doctor on people. Like, you know, you're telling your, your siblings, lay down, I wanna play doctor, right? You're gonna be the patient, right? That's someone who's like, it's in their, it's in, they're wired to be a healer. Maybe they'll become a physician, maybe a nurse, maybe an acupuncturist, maybe a nutritionist, but maybe they're gonna work as a emergency medical you know, EMT, emergency medical tech, but they're a healer, right? So just pay attention. Like, what was it? Maybe you were a poet. Maybe you've been writing. Uh, uh, about a couple of, when did you start writing poetry? Um, when I was about 12 or 13. Yeah. Yeah, so that's it. And for a lot of us, for many people I found your mission between seven and 17, there was something like knocking at the door, like this is you, what you love. So those are just three uh, ways to discover the true you and your mission. There are others, but those are three, inshallah. Um, the next question, there is a hadith that says, Allah loves you more than 70 mothers. Uh, why is there a specific number? And perhaps there's a number of hadith that mention very specific numbers. So maybe you could relate that. Yeah, alhamdulillah, uh, I think I saw someone actually answer that. 70 in Arabic is uh, it's a number that symbolizes not necessarily infinity, but uh, I'll just countless. You know, it's like a million in English. I told you a million times, you know, do this or don't do this, right? Maybe you heard your mother or your father say that to you, right? <laughs> they didn't actually tell you a million times. So the Arabs... Uh, with their eloquence, and the Arabs were very eloquent, mashallah. Uh, you know, they had words that describe all kinds of things, you know, uh, animal, uh, a she camel that gave birth to a calf that has like bl black spots on it, and it lives in the desert, and it's walking at this time of day. Like they have one word to describe that, you know. That's, <laughs> there, was a, there was a scholar from Egypt that wrote a book, uh, like 500 words for lion in the Arabic language. You know, Abbas, Asad, Laith, Hamza, you know, and then it goes on and on. So, but even with the eloquence, they didn't have that many numbers. So 70, 70,000, 700, uh, that meant like a number that was beyond what you could fathom, you know. And, or they might say something like alf alf, you know, which is a million, you know, a thousand times a thousand. So that's why, uh, and that's that's why the hadith that mention you know seventy thousand angels or, uh, or 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 do something, say something seventy thousand seventy times, it's not it shouldn't be taken literally, and Allah knows best. The next question is. How can we raise ourselves and our families in the suhba, in the companionship that we're discussing here in the current context, especially in the West, where we don't necessarily live in close proximity 
to people of Allah or even to others? How can we practically uh, seek and apply this into our lives in a Western context? So the question is, how do we apply what was said about companionship? Yeah, in, in, in our context, it's often hard to find stuff, but find that companionship with, with people of Allah. Um, so what are some practical um, you know, ways to seek and apply this in our lives? Okay, so I'm going to be give you practical advice. Then I'm going to give the kind of like, you know, I won't call it non-practical, but this is just this anecdotal. Practical advice is, <clears throat> you know, you ask Allah to guide you to such people and you pay attention to the people around you. And when you find a brother or a sister who uh, is relatively uh, righteous, you know, they, they don't hurt people. They're not self-centered. They're always helping others. You know, they observe their religious duties. And that's someone you should assume uh, is <clears throat> one of those that are near to Allah Ta'ala. And there may be people that you encounter who, again, a gaze from them, a nadra, right, or a word from them, just, you know, you just feel your, your, your faith soars. You're just happy when you're around them. And sometimes those people are Muslim. And sometimes they may not be Muslim. You should be open. And, you know, I used to live in the South. Right now I'm in the Northeast. But I, re I remember a friend of mine who lived in, you know, I lived in Atlanta for a long time, lived in Houston for a long time, Texas. And uh, I had a friend who was in, it was Alabama. Yeah. And they, no, this was Albany, Georgia. And he said, you know what? The people of faith around here are Christian. You know, there are not many Muslims here. In, in Albany, Georgia, there was like two mosques, you know, a few Muslims, but the people of faith, the people of connection to God, for the most part, were Christians there. And he was just confiding in me. Like, I feel good about around these people. And I, I would encourage you to really take this hadith to heart. When you see a person who reminds you of Allah, then that's someone whose companionship is valuable, regardless of the label, regardless of the label, regardless of whether they call themselves a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian or a Hindu or a Buddhist, if they remind you of God, of the creator, then that person uh, is someone who you can benefit from. And we have many, 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 many examples in our history of Muslims benefiting from the company of those who are not, who do not self-identify as Muslim, but their character reminds you of Prophet Muhammad And you may even find some of these people who are actually monotheists, like radical monotheists. So don't limit yourself, because like, when I'm hearing this question, I'm hearing someone who thinks, okay, you know, I'm not around that many, there are not many Muslims around me, and definitely not many Muslims like what we've been talking about, you know, for the past hour and a half. Don't limit yourself, really, you know? And I'm not, I'm not saying that a person who's a Jew or a Christian or a Buddhist or a Hindu or practices Ifa, for example, I'm not saying that you or I should adopt their belief system. I'm not saying that. I'm not, I'm not you know, peddling any perennialism here, okay? Disclaimer, no perennialism here, right? But I am saying that there's, there's benefit in being around people who remember God, regardless of their religion. And I found 
people like that across religions, alhamdulillah. Uh, even if there are issues and problems with some of their, their beliefs. Uh, and, and in conclusion uh, to this answer, I've, I've lived a lot of places, you know, um, in this country and, and traveled a few places outside this country. Uh, and I, I feel like every city I've lived in, I've encountered awliya. And, you know, there's that saying, uh, seeing is believing. I flip it around. Believing is seeing. Like if you believe, if you have a good opinion of Allah Ta'ala, that in every city, in every village, in every town, there's at least one person, at least one person there that Allah has chosen. Inshallah, you'll meet them. Inshallah, right? And I, 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 you know, and you know, again, you can take it for what it's worth. You don't have to believe it. You know, you, can, you know. Uh, but yeah, I, I feel like I've met such people everywhere I've been. Like, and a lot of times they're just, again, they might like, like when you read about the Prophet, so I said, oh, this is one of the hadith I'm going to be sharing in the other class, um, Black Lives Around the Messenger. One day, have anyone has anyone heard about Yasar al Aswad? Anyone? Raise your hand in the chat. Yasar al-Aswad, anyone heard of him? Anyone? Okay. One day Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was in the masjid with Abu Huraira. And he told him, one of the seven people through whom Allah protects the entire earth is about to enter. And he said at that moment, Abu Huraira said at that moment, a black man entered the masjid and he had one ear missing and a, ju a jug of water on his head and a broom. You know those brooms, like those of you who've been to Africa, maybe they have them in Indonesia too. Those brooms that, you know, it's like a broomstick, but there's no handle. You ever seen those, right? He had a broom in his hand and then he started to sprinkle water around the masjid and sweep. The Prophet Sallallahu said to Abu Huraira, that's him. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ahlan Yasar, welcome Yasar, welcome Yasar, welcome Yasar, three times. So these, these people are everywhere and, and, and you know, I'm there. they're everywhere. And it might be the person who's missing an ear, who's cleaning the masjid with a broom. You never know. Inshallah. So the next question uh, ties in with this and then maybe I could even af ask a question of my own uh, that ties in as well. So uh, this question is, uh, the person said, a few weeks ago, I asked if the Olia were dwindling in number if that's not the case, how do we understand the, ver the verse in Surah Al-Waqi'ah mentioned today, as sabiqun as sabiqun who are described as a few from the later generations? So that's the question. And then I wanted to also post to you, when you were speaking just now, I thought of um, in the Ihya al Madini, Imam Ghazali mentions, and of course he was writing 900 years ago, but he said the best thing you could do for your spiritual progress is find a true... Uh, Sheikh Murabi Wali, like a perfected spiritual master to guide you on the path. He said, but in our time, that is exceedingly rare. Yeah. He said, so the second best thing, if you can't find that is, and this is kind of the advice I was hearing from you, is to find sincere companions on the path because they, it, together, you, that will take the place to the best of the ability of that completed master, so to speak. So I don't know if that ties in. It does. Yeah, it does tie in. The awliya, the numbers of the awliya, are they dwindling? Um, you know, and, and mashallah, I think the questioner mentioned, you know, Surah Al-Waqi'ah, right? Allah says, Qalilun min al-akhirin, right? 
about the those who are drawn near, a few of them, right, are from the uh, the later generations. Allah mentions three groups just so that everyone's on the same page. There's this chapter in the Quran, Surah Al Waqi'ah. Uh, I believe it's chapter fifty six. Is it chapter fifty six? Um, forgive me if I'm mistaken. The chapter of the calamitous event. And Allah mentions three groups of people at the beginning. Fifth, yeah, okay, thank you, 56. Alhamdulillah. Allah mentions three groups of people. He mentions the companions of the left and, and the companions of the right. And then Allah mentions the foremost. And these are three groups of people uh, that exist now and that who they are, their identities though in this life are really unknown, they're hidden. But on the day of judgment, their identities will be manifest. And again, this is not about religion. <laughs> it's not about religion, right? Allah doesn't say Muslims, Jews, and Christians. <laughs> you know, it's like at the beginning of the Quran, Allah mentions uh, the muttaqun, Allah mentions the, the disbelievers, and then Allah describes the, the hypocrites. You know, he doesn't, you know, all this other stuff, right? Re you know, identity politics. Uh-uh, no. And so the first group, the people of the left, are people who are either you know, disobedient scholars, describe them as either disobedient Muslims or people that are just outright, they, they reject the truth of God. Right? And disobedient Muslims meaning those who do make major sins like unabashedly without shame. The people of the right, and those are people who receive their book of deeds in their left hand from behind their backs, right, from the angels. Then there are people who on the day of judgment are called the companions of the right, who will receive their book of deeds in their, in their right hands. They'll have that honor. Uh, and they may have also been disobedient Muslims, right? But Allah forgave them. And, you know, these are righteous people. These are believers. These are faithful people. Uh, and again, you know, don't think that this is an exclusive club that's based on your religious, uh, your religious affiliation. Like these are people who whatever truth Allah revealed to them, they embraced. And Allah only holds people accountable for what they know, All right? And then there's another group called As-Sabiqun, Al-Mukarrabun that the questioner is referring to. These are the foremost, these are the elite of the elite. These are the near, those that are near Allah. Uh, these are the people that, that went above and beyond and who their, their aspiration was beyond going to paradise, going to the garden. Their aspiration was the face of God. And Allah describes these muqarrabun in another place in the Quran, right? Where he mentions those whom he has favored from the prophets, from the siddiqun, from the the, the truthful, uh, who affirm the truth and speak the truth from the shuhada, from the witnesses, and from the righteous. And Allah says about them, They are the most beautiful of companions. These four groups. These are the muqarrabun. And these are the people who, whenever we recite al-Fatiha, when we say, Sirat al-Ladina anamta alihim, the path of those whom you have favored, these are the people we're talking about. So right when you and I recite Al-Fatiha, we're asking Allah to guide us to the path of the Muqarrabun. And what I've been taught, yes, you are absolutely right, as Allah says, the, the numbers of the Muqarrabun will be fewer in later generations than they were in the earlier generations. Yes, because that's just the nature of this world. Um, no time comes after another except there's a greater amount of, of, of evil than the time before it. You know, and if this didn't happen, well, how will the word, world end? <laughs> you know, like you can't have righteous people on the earth when it ends. Like this is the sunnah of Allah Ta'ala. So yes, I mean, yeah, that's a very good point. I, and I don't remember the conversation we had a few weeks ago. But yes, as Allah says, 
with each generation, the numbers of those that are near Allah, uh, it, it, over time, they get fewer. But, but the, this world is still blessed. Like right now, the time we're living in, alhamdulillah. I mean, the fact that like people like Sheikh Ahmed Fal, Murat Ahmed Fal, who just passed, like the fact that we knew him, people lived with him and studied with him. And, and then there's so many other men and women that are around us, uh, mashallah, today. So we're still living in a very, very good time when um, it may not be as easy as it was, you know, 500 years ago to find these people, but they're still around. Alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah. So uh, we're over time. Jazakallah khair. There were a few other questions, inshallah. Uh, please, inshallah, we can get to them next week. Uh, and uh, we're very grateful to have you all. And inshallah, we hope that you'll join us for the number of other programs that we have going on this month at Wasat. Uh, you can visit our website to find out more. And also, as we mentioned in the beginning, uh, Imam Mendes is teaching um, with Celebrate Mer Mercy um black sahaba beautiful beautiful uh, is it a 10 part series yeah yes it's a uh, black lives around the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam yeah and uh, it's 10 part series we have nine more to go uh it's it will generally be uh sundays tuesdays and wednesdays 8 30 eastern so i know that's a little early for you guys um but uh if you register you'll get the recordings alhamdulillah and it's free it's a free course, and um, uh, but this Sunday we won't be having it because it's Super Bowl Sunday. I heard, mm. so we're not going to be competing with the Super Bowl. <laughs> so. If you still want some spiritual spiritual Super Bowl, you can join our uh, heart centric this Sunday. Uh, right, Camila, that's yeah. The so I mean, I mean. Yeah, Allah. Khair, inshallah. It's great to see everyone. Allah bless you all, yeah. and. Uh, Inshallah, Imam Mendes, if you want to just close with a, with a prayer, Inshallah. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil alamin. Salallahu alayhi wa sallam. Salallahu alayhi wa sallam. Salallahu alayhi wa Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Wa nashiru an la ilayla anta wa nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Oh Allah, you are perfect. You are divinely perfect. We praise you with your praises. We ask your forgiveness and we turn, always turn back to you, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, we ask that you forgive us. We ask that you have mercy upon us. We ask that you transform and change our wrongs, our wrong deeds into good deeds and that you transform our good deeds into lofty ranks and, and, and stations in your presence. Oh Allah, we ask that you make us from your awliya, oh Allah, awliya or rahman We ask, oh Allah, that you guide us to the presence of the male and female awliya of our time, ya Allah and that you grant us the benefit of their companionship, that you grant us the benefit of, of serving them, of, of helping them, of supporting them, of learning from them. Uh, we ask that you grant us the benefit of visiting the living among them and the dead, Ya Allah. We ask that you make our spouses from your awliya. We ask that you make our children and the children of our children to the day of judgment from your awliya. We ask that you make our parents, Ya Allah, from your awliya. Oh Allah, we ask that you, uh, that you bless Wasat, the, the, the family of Wasat, the organization and the brothers and sisters who attend their programs, who organize their programs, who volunteer, uh, the, their staff, their donors, Ya Allah, their boards, Ya Allah, we ask that you bless them and give them every facilitation. Make them a beacon of, of light and guidance and healing uh, for the world, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And oh Allah, I ask, we, we ask, Ya Allah, through all of your beautiful names for healing for our brother, Umar Mahmoud. Uh, ya Allah, we ask that you give him quick and complete healing. We ask for healing for our brother, Imam Suhaib Sultan. Ya Allah, oh Allah, we ask that you grant uh, Murabt Ahmed Fal the highest paradise without reckoning or punishment, and that you bring. Uh, comfort, solace, and serenity to the to the hearts of his loved ones. O oh Allah, fulfill the needs of all those that are here, our brothers and sisters, Ya Allah. Uh, fulfill their, their worldly needs, their religious needs, their spiritual needs, 
their otherworldly needs, Ya Allah. We ask that you fulfill their needs according to that which you love and you choose and what brings happiness to our hearts and their hearts, Ya Allah. Give us victory, Ya Allah. إِذَا جَاءَ النَّصُرُ اللَّهِ وَفَتْحٌ قَرِيبٌ Allah, we ask you for a, an opening, Ya Allah, and a, manif a near opening in victory, Ya Rabbil Alameen. وَصَلِ اللَّهُ مَلَى سِيدِنَا مُحَمَّدْ وَآلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَسَلِّمْ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّكَ رَبِّ الْعِزَّةِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ وَسَلَامٌ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَلَمِينَ With the intention of acceptance, uh, let us all recite Al-Fatiha. Bismillah. Amin, Amin, Amin. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sidi Ahmad. Thank you, Sayyidah Kamina, Sayyidah Mokmin, and, and Sam, mashallah, Sidi Sam. Thank you. All of you, brothers and sisters, thank you so much. Jazakallah khair. Thank you, Sheikh Mendes. Uh, I want to also, again, thanks, Ma thank MAPS CDEI for co sponsoring, and thank all of you for showing up. Keep us in your prayers, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa